my personal mission within this, and part of why I run this company, is to connect people to themselves, each other, and the world. In addition to straight up consulting work and design, I also teach meditation and facilitate personal mastery. We'll get into that a little bit more later in this. We'll return to industrial ecology throughout this lecture, but it's what informs pretty much all of my work. My degree is in industrial ecology as a specific scientific field. And we define industrial ecology as the study of the interconnectedness of human systems. So what we're doing is looking at energy, water, and materials, and how they flow through systems of different time and space scales. And then from there, trying to understand the environmental, social, and economic impacts of those flows. So for those of you who aren't familiar with an industrial ecology, the metaphor that I like to use for it, or visualization, is if you think of sort of like our linear economy right now of extraction, consumption, waste, and a lot of times when we're talking about more progressive design, we're talking about taking that linear economy and turning it into a circle, which is great. Circles are good, but circles are still two-dimensional objects on a plane that don't actually exist. And so what does it take to take this idea of a circular economy and translate that into something that we can actually do in the world, in, within human society? So what my work does, along with the work of many other people now, is takes that line, transforms it into a circle, and then starts to say, what happens when we add a social dimension? What does it take to take this concept of a circular economy and transform it into an actual sphere, into a functional object, into a functional idea by adding in social considerations and an understanding of how humans work. Not that I really actually understand that, but I attempt to, at least. So what we do is we take this three-dimensional sphere then, and we take that and we put it out over time and space as our other dimensions of consideration. So then you're talking about energy, water, and materials, how it flows through a system with a social understanding, and then you're asking, what are the relevant scales of time? What are the relevant scales of space? And so, you know, a grounded example with that is saying, you know, what's a relevant time scale? Climate change has a very different relevant time scale than indoor air quality does. There are, there's no one value judgment that's better than another, but a kid who has asthma today may not have time to be concerned about what's going to happen with climate change in 100 years. Um, and so the question becomes, what's a relevant time scale based on what we have reason to value? And I'll get into that a little bit later. Any questions on that before I go on? I realize industrial ecology can be a kind of new concept for people. OK, feel free to um, give me a shout at any point if anything's not making sense. So if you guys will bear with me from that visualization, I want to stretch your imaginations a little bit farther, and this ties into the rest of the presentation. So if I can get everybody to close their eyes, and drawing on this vision, or this idea and mission of working to create an ecologically regenerative and socially just world, if you start just even by taking a few breaths and asking yourself, what even comes to mind when you hear this? What's in your world that is ecologically regenerative or socially just? What's the vision that you have for this, if anything? Who are the people that are here? What are the buildings or plants or animals that are here? And so when you're ready, opening your eyes back up and coming back to this room for a minute, what are, what are a few things that people see that are potential for having an ecologically regenerative and socially just world? What comes to mind for people? There's no right answer here. <laughs> Nor is it a tri trick question. Other people who have excess of one thing, spread it around, and what goes around from there. Totally. Education. Great. What else? 
interventions along borders. What, tell me a little bit more about that. <laughs> uh, the thing that I think about is like a lot of times between neighborhoods and cities there are empty lots. Mm -hmm. That's a place for an intervention. Cool. Anybody else have anything they want to add? So from there, if I can get everybody to close your eyes again and then ask what you look like in this world. Who are you in this world that you're envisioning? What about you is similar? What about you now can support this vision? And what needs to change? Whenever you're ready, you can come back and open your eyes. This isn't something you have to share since it tends to be pretty personal for people. Um, but it's something that if you haven't thought about yet, is something to start potentially thinking about in your own lives. And part of my work with all this is this idea of not just how do we change this outside world, but without getting into you know, Gandhiisms <laughs> too much, but what do we actually need to change in ourselves? So much of what we tend to externalize right now in terms of corporate control or government control of things are elements that we actually drive ourselves through our choices, through our concepts of what the world is, through the ways that we interact with each other, through the values that we hold. Um, and it's something where there isn't one right or wrong answer for any of this, but it's something where we can start to think about it and start to consider it. And that in and of itself acts as a starting point. So from here, I'm going to get into slightly wonkier things now that we have that little foundation. To this idea that we can only create consciously what we are able to articulate. So that goes to the whole idea of asking what does a socially just and ecologically regenerative world look like? How can we create that if we can't begin to actually envision it? So what we do is we're simultaneously looking to understand what is a fundamentally new system that we can step into, but also understanding what are the incremental choices that we can make today and each day going forward in order to support that transition in the long run. So my business partner and I, um, her name's Eva Gladek and she's based in the Netherlands, have been building a systemic approach to food and food systems for the past three years. And like many of you, we want to change the system both as an imperative and as an opportunity. And so we're constantly drawing on systems thinking and this concept of looking for the best places to intervene in, in a system. And so when we look at food systems, we're asking what's the best place to sort of poke at this system in order to redirect it without having to necessarily tackle the entire food system all at once. And so as we learn and iteratively go through this process, we're increasingly focused on the idea of how do we actually implement new ideas? Not just how do we envision new ideas, but how do we ourselves start to realize these visions? And how do we help other people do the same? Because while we might not have this comprehensive vision for an ecologically regenerative world, we do have some ideas of what we should be doing, and we're not even doing those. So, the question is, if we know what we're, where we're supposed to be heading generally, and we're not doing that, we're not stupid creatures. There's got to be something else going on. And so there's this big question of how. How do we actually get the world to change? Not just what do we envision could happen, but how are we going to change it? So as I was saying about industrial ecology, but I'll keep returning to, because it's a new concept for a lot of people, is we tend to approach any system as a composition of stocks and flows, of understanding where there are resources in a system, like say a lake, which is a stock of water, and a flow out of it, like a river, at a very simple level. But then asking how we can apply that kind of concept to everything in the world around us. And then along with a number of our collaborators, 
we're starting to look at the economic and social dimensions associated with these flows of energy, water, and materials through systems. Mostly because we want to understand what are the drivers of decision making? What is this how component for how to start to deal with the world? And as I'll get into a little bit more after this sort of methodological section, into the food system. So what this looks like, without getting too far into the weeds on it, is starting to think about all the different factors that actually drive decision making. And so, can everybody see this all right? Um, so starting to think from like a large level down to a personal level of looking at an ecosphere and so actual resource availability, like how much gold is there on the market right now? How much oil is there on the market right now? Like big, usually planet scale or nation scale questions. But starting to draw that down through the different scales of consideration for any project. All the way down to how's an individual actually functioning? What are the cultural norms that we have? What are the assumptions that we come into an interaction with? Like, do we assume that we should be collaborating with each other, for example? Do people come into an interaction like that? Or are they thinking, I actually want to take a step back. I don't really want to be talking to people. That is not, that's not the way I do things. And you never know until you ask somebody what they're coming into an interaction with behind them. But where this starts to become really interesting is starting to think about how people actually work together around goals that we're looking to see in the world. So a, kind of a pretty technical term is inter-firm resource synergies, which is a really fancy way of saying one company taking another company's waste and turning it into a raw material for a new process. That's an outcome we actually want to see in the world because it cuts down on waste and it cuts down on new resource use and you're getting people to get used to working together between companies, which is something I have reason to value, at least on a personal level. So a lot of my research has looked at this on a technical level, but it asks how do all of these other factors play into this outcome that we're looking for? Everything from resource availability and cost all the way to the level of what are the cultural norms? What are your actual cognitive structures for how you deal with people? And then what are your structural connections with other people? Like how, what is the extent of your social network? Not Facebook friends, but your actual physical social network. Who do you talk to? Who do you work with? Who do you share ideas with? Who do you share resources with? So I'm just going to go over a couple of the drivers in a little bit more detail. And so social capital is something that is a term that gets thrown around a lot within talking about systems or just talking about development in general. And the way that we define it, and this is based on other people's work out in the academic sphere, is as access to resources within a network. And you obviously then get into the tricky question of like, well, what resources are important? <laughs> What resources are we looking to access? And so what we try to do is say from a perspective that is supported by Marcia Sen, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, is saying it's about what people have reason to value. Human development is this process of expanding access to what you have reason to value. So it's not me saying this is the resource that you are supposed to value. It's me saying what resource do you value? How can you bring this forward in collaboration with other people around you or across your network. So this all ties into that overall idea of trust and cooperation. And I'm going to talk a little bit later in this presentation about three different projects we're working on. The last one, I'm going to be talking about trust infrastructure, trust and collaboration infrastructure, and the idea of how do you actually facilitate on a large scale people increasingly working with each other around shared values, around sharing resources, around taking the resources that we have right now and leveraging those resources into something that we want to create going into the future. And so all this, though, is underpinned by money being the primary and dominant form of communication on the planet right now. And so part of our work is this process of getting really comfortable with, the, with that idea. Not attaching any value judgment to it of money's good, money's bad, but seeing money in and of itself as value neutral and as something that sends very strong signals within the system at the moment. So then the usefulness of that becomes, one, so that we can first shift 
how money flows within the system, which is a more, a more simple change. But then the ultimate goal of shifting what's actually valued within the system. And ultimately, that may not be money. But for now, we, it's what we have to go on. So what does this actually look like on a practical level? Um, I'm going to present you guys with a couple of diagrams from research that I've done, um, specifically on social connections. So what we do is go from something like information, which is like this is a network of industries that's represented right here, and who talks to who, how frequently. But this is just information. This doesn't really actually get us anywhere. We're like, great, there's a lot of industries. They talk to each other. That doesn't do much for us in and of itself. But what you can start to do is take kind of complex information like this and layer it together in ways where we start to ask, what resources are we accessing? So this starts to be a network map of who within an industrial cluster is actually trading resources with each other, is trading wastes. And from there, looking at values that we actually, or outcomes that we have reason to value, which is, this is an industrial system that I worked with in India, this is a sugarcane refinery and distillery, and we're talking about, if you guys can see the values here, say around 70,000 tons of biodegradable material that's effectively reused within a system. And based on this understanding of this is actually something that we have reason to value, corporations effectively reusing waste that have value, but it's connected with what the system actually looks like on a social level. Who talks to each other? Who knows each other? What resources are they interested in sharing with each other? So I'm going to move on a little bit, but I wanted to see if there's any questions before I do. That's the sort of methodological section of what I'm talking about. Anybody feeling overwhelmed? Show of hands. <laughs> Kate. Um, how many of you guys have heard of Donella Meadows? So this is one of my favorite quotes anywhere. Um, and it's from Donella Meadows. And then it's this idea, to paraphrase it, if, for anybody who can't read it, is that what we're looking to do in living within a complex system is expanding the system boundary or the horizons of what we're looking at in a specific sense, like a material or energy or water flow sense. But it's also about expanding the horizons of caring. And that's not something that's done very easily. But as you guys will see throughout the th three examples that I'm about to talk about, what we're trying to do ultimately is weave caring together with very functional analyses with actually being able to say, hey, here's the amount of water that's moving in a system. Here's the amount of materials that's moving in a system. Things that people care about on this quantitative environmental or social level. But then saying, how does this actually come back to what we have reason to value? How does it come back to things that we actually enjoy, that inspire us, that create a world that we actually want to live in, rather than just a world of, say, a lower carbon footprint or something like that? So. For anybody who hasn't read Danella Meadows, I highly recommend her. So the first of our three projects that I'm going to talk about is something called, that was initially called Polydome, but we're in the process of likely renaming Symbioculture, which is the title of this talk. Um, and as a young company, my company's constantly in the process of trying to figure out what's the most effective way to talk about what we do, because we do a lot of different things on the front end, but with this same systems understanding on the back end. So what Polydome started out as was a systemic approach to looking at agriculture on a practical level. We did the initial project for the Dutch government. And what we were asking is, can we take a polyculture of 50 plus different animals, plants, and fungi and put it into a commercial greenhouse setting and beat the economic productivity per square meter that you would get in a monocrop conventional greenhouse. That was like our primary challenge with it. It's since grown into this entire design approach, but it started from this very grounded question of saying, can we come up with a design concept even to present to the Dutch greenhouse industry that can beat out their current figures for productivity on a financial level? And this is relevant because the Netherlands is the world's second or third largest agricultural exporter by dollar value. 
and it's all greenhouse horticulture. So they actually are probably the only place in the world that's really willing to invest money in new ways of looking at greenhouse growing systems and commercial greenhouses in particular. So what we ended up doing with the project is building on this initial foundation of asking a fairly specific question of can we beat the economic productivity, but then in the process of attempting to accomplish that, we developed a design approach for actually looking at replicable ways to combine animals, plants, and fungi into commercial systems, but doing that in a much larger context. And instead of just asking what is sort of a larger scale, straight up permaculture growing question of, you know, which plants and which animals would you put together into a guild planting, but asking what are the ways that we can start to look at the connection between this specific system of growing and everything else that's around it. And this idea almost of gaming the food system, because what we're seeing now is that people are talking about, you know, organic food is too expensive. But then other people are saying organic food doesn't cost enough. And what I see is that there's plenty of money in the food system. It just doesn't go to responsible growing at the moment. It's trapped throughout the other stops on the value chain in between a farm and when you eat your food. And a lot of other money is tied up in other practices that are ultimately inefficient within a greenhouse system. And so when we started to look at this, we started to ask about time scales and about spatial scales. And I'll show you, what you, you guys what this looks like in a moment. But the idea is how do you start to play with time if you have a controlled greenhouse environment? You can actually play with planting schedules. And when you play with planting schedules, you play with labor schedules. You're able to give people full-time jobs. You're able to actually have predictable needs and predictable cash flow throughout a year. So you start to be able to change when financial resources are needed, when human resources are needed, and being able to have a more actual economically sustainable business out of that. So what this starts to look like on a practical level of actually building up this model and I apologize, there's so much detail with a bunch of this that it's not really going to come out. But the essential components that you can see here is there's a very specific reason why most greenhouse agriculture grows tomatoes and lettuce. Because that's what's at this end of the scale in terms of annual greenhouse yields per meter square. That's why you get a monocrop conventional greenhouse of tomatoes. Um, and why you also grow greens, although people just can't eat enough lettuce to really satisfy all of the production within a system if it was only greens. So what we did was we started from scratch, essentially, and asked with this, what is the value in US dollars per kilogram plotted against the annual greenhouse yield per meter squared? and starting to select crops for understanding that we want to have something that's economically productive, but also that has other values, like being productive in terms of calories, like not requiring chemical inputs, like not having significant greenhouse gas emissions or massive water use, all these other considerations that we have reason to value. So what we did was we built on that information and started to collect other information, like the productive lifespan of perennial crops to plant within the system. And asking, you know, when does this plant actually become productive? What are the cycles of productivity over time? And then using that kind of information both to determine what itself is planted and what are the time horizons for different financial returns within the system but also asking what should be planted together. What fits together based on when it comes to maturity or when it doesn't come to maturity? And how does that fit together with harvesting and planting schedules and other considerations like that? So combining that kind of information with, oh, this is too small. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. This is an actual annual planting schedule for, say, annuals that are in a hydroponic system and actually being able to say out over time within any given year when a plant gets planted, when it gets harvested, and by nature of understanding that, understanding where labor comes into this. OK, 
Can you guys who are at the back actually see any of this? Ish? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to do some more zoom ins. How's that? Okay, good. So then taking this information and combining it with all the other planting factors. So now we're thinking about, we've, we've thought about time dimensions, or money dimensions, time dimensions, to an extent space dimensions. But the other concerns within this are very practical farming concerns about space dimensions, such as what's the soil pH that this plant would like to be in? And there's a fairly broad range of what soil pH plants like to be in. Then on this side um, is water requirements. Because even if plants like the same pH, they may or may not like the same amount of moisture. And so you start to get you know, <laughs> some new and creative methods being implemented by us for trying to map this out. This is, I mean, I wouldn't say that this is the most brilliant infographic that the world has ever seen. Um, but it starts to get the job done because you're, you're like, okay, so these kind of work together and these kind of work together. And when we started doing this, and we're still not at the point where we can say, punch 10 crops into a, an automated system and it pops up how they should be combined or something like that. But this was our first go at trying to understand how this could look visualized. Ah, and then the other thing is the color coding for how many chill hours a plant needs. Um, some, you guys may or may not be familiar with the idea that a lot of perennial plants from higher latitudes actually need a specific amount of hours under a specific temperature in order to continue to be productive over time, um, which is a factor in perennial indoor plantings that we hadn't expected to initially have to deal with. And then this, at a very practical level, is what a plan ends up actually looking like. <laughs> a lot of time in Adobe Illustrator with lots of little copied icons and you know, putting them together. Um, but the idea becomes, actually, what, is a, what does a guild planting look like in a controlled environment? And backing that planting up not just with information that we tend to look at for permaculture or for polyculture studies, such as which plants get along in which space and pH value and things like that, but instead saying, what's the economic value of this? Now that we know what we want to have together, how do we then go back to our original question of how do we beat the economic productivity of a con conventional tomato greenhouse and start to play with this? And make it so that we have greenhouses that are polycultures and where the different components are working together, but at the same time where it is a proposition where you could actually potentially get an investor to fund it. It's a proposition where you could convince a commercial grower to begin to grow this way instead of just doing a straight monocrop of tomatoes. And that is where we're heading next. But first, one last little graphic. Uh, there we go. <laughs> what this looks like on a large scale, then, is a flowchart. And looking at the different components of the system and all the different inputs and outputs <laughs> that you get from it at an engineering level. So looking at hydroponic setup, perennials, annuals, and then understanding what the outputs are, both in terms of functional and sort of obviously marketable materials like fruits, vegetables, fish, mushrooms, but then also understanding what are all the different waste streams that we can use? What are all the ways that we can layer together both the primary outputs of an agricultural system along with all of the secondary or even what are considered to be waste or byproduct outputs right now so that they can all get reused in at least a cost neutral if not actually like value positive kind of way and connect in with the broader system. And I don't have a good diagram of this, but one of the ways that this can start to apply is asking if you have a single farm or a single greenhouse right now, how does that one development fit in with the rest of the system around it? How can these flows that come out of this system connect with, say, another greenhouse or with a community? And so in the place where I live in, in New Haven, Connecticut, we've looked at this to an extent and asked, if we were to build a symbioculture or polydome-based greenhouse in New Haven, what would that actually look like? 
and both what would that look like on a practical level, but how would we connect that with all the different initiatives that are going on here already and all the different needs here so that people actually want this? I mean, not that people tend to be too opposed to greenhouses, but most people can kind of take it or leave it when it comes to a greenhouse, unless it's the coolest looking greenhouse you've ever seen. Um, but we don't want to sell this project just on the idea that it looks cool. We want it to be something that actually interacts with the community. So you can start to think about the other social dimensions that I was speaking about before of how can an agricultural system, a, a system of actually growing and producing food, start to fit in at all those different levels of resources. And there's some fairly obvious answers now within the food system, things like CSAs and other ways to shorten the food value chain. But then there are a lot of other opportunities that involve working with other local businesses, both in terms of inputs and outputs from the system, but also collaborating with other farmers. And for example, if you have a investor-backed commercial greenhouse going into a place where no other farmers have investments behind them, that's not something you necessarily want to do either because you have a distinct competitive advantage. And so the question becomes, how can you talk with farmers in the system so you're not just coming in and undercutting them on their high-end greens or on their heirloom tomatoes when they're in season or something along those lines. You're asking what a community actually needs. And that's one of the things that I find most fun about this approach is that it's not saying you have to only grow tomatoes or you have to only grow greens. It's asking, what do people here want to eat? What's not being produced already within the food system? And then how within that can we take what people actually want, the resources that they want, the food that they want, and backtrack from there a little bit or look at a slightly broader level and ask how can we make that financially profitable so that, so that somebody would actually come in and build this, particularly within an urban system. But it is applicable in rural systems as well. So what we've been doing now for the last year or so is looking to actually pilot these ideas in a practical setting. And for better or for worse, there aren't a lot of opportunities to do this in the US, at least not with funding. <laughs> so we've been doing this in the Netherlands. And so over the last year, we've gone through the process of translating this design concept into practical designs for Dutch greenhouse growers and are now in the process of winning funding to actually pilot those designs within one setup. Because as you guys can guess from everything I've said, there are a lot of moving parts. We've been very conservative with modeling the different components and the different um, aspects of performance within the system, but that doesn't mean it's all going to work. <laughs> um, and we would never try to pretend otherwise. I mean, I think many people know that polyculture works at some level, but very few, I'd say very few farmers know how to grow even, say, 10 crops really well in an organic greenhouse. But what about 50 different crops? There's not really, that's one of the other elements of the system. Nobody really knows how to do this yet. There's nobody who's just, you know, has magically has like a master's degree in polyculture greenhouse setups or something like that. So um, it's going to be a learning process going forward. Um, but we are really, we're really excited about it. And so what it looks like on a really basic level um, is slightly more boring outputs than our initial report, but also and when I say boring, meaning fewer crops and a little bit more in rows. <laughs> um, but at the same time, going from our ideas into what's a grower actually going to deal with? What are they actually going to put into their greenhouse sight unseen, essentially? Um, so it's something where hopefully in the next year or two we'll actually have some level of results about this. Um, and it will be available online when we do. Um, so here's the obligatory chicken picture. Um, and before I move on to other, two other food system projects, I just want to see if there are any questions on Folly Dome, or we can, I can return to it at the end with Q&A. Are there any quick questions on this? Have you been incorporating animals into that system? Yeah, so I didn't get into too many of the actual design elements of the system, but so it's, it's 50 plus different species of animals, plants, and fungi. And so there's both sort of productive animals within it that actually have cash or market value as well as micro livestock. So they're designed into the system right now are conservative estimates for a basal and tilapia aquaponics system. 
um, although the much, much more interesting ones, but we didn't have the data to model it, are multi-trophic aquaponics systems where, and some of them aren't really legal in the US, but you can do a like trophic cascade is what it's called, um, of like Asian carp, which are an invasive species here, which is why it's not allowed. Um, and trophic cascade means that you're essentially cycling resources through multiple species within a designed or controlled setup. And so you can combine Asian carp along with crayfish and you can do it alongside a setup where you have um, a specific type of mushroom that like breeds insect larvae that the fish like that also prevents eutrophication of the water that you know there's there's re these really great design concepts that come out of permaculture and smaller scale um, I'd say like home scale permaculture but that we didn't have the data to actually include in the system we have it sort of as an addendum to it like if somebody can do this research we can put this in but for now we have to for the sake of attempting to actually get this funded, <laughs> um, we had to put pretty conservative estimates into it. But so, the, so there's tilapia, and then um, there's different legality to different um, livestock in different places. But the system's modeled for having free-range chickens in it, both for meat and for eggs. Um, different people have different ideas about that, but um, but it's something where. I think it'd be great if it actually happened in practice. There are some very practical concerns with chickens, specifically, um, because their wastes are fairly nitrogen rich, and so it can end up causing burning of certain leaf types on plants that are sensitive to nitrogen. So I've seen solutions where people use other um, smaller livestock, not micro livestock, but small livestock within a, a greenhouse setup in order to get around that nitrogen issue. Yeah. Do you have a sense of what scale is possible? What kind of yield is possible? Yeah, so the, the scale of the development right now, the initial version of the report was done for one hectare, which is about 2.2 acres. And the reason for that is that's the sm like I said, Netherlands just exists on a different scale for greenhouses than we do. That's considered the minimum viable scale for an organic greenhouse in the Netherlands. Minimum viable scale for a conventional greenhouse is five hectares. <laughs> they go up to 50. So um, this was initially designed, yeah, like I said, for a hectare. And some of the some of the yields are dependent on having higher end climate control systems as well as building envelopes. Um, and so we've batted around the idea of what's the minimum viable size. And there are, it depends essentially on how much a person's willing to spend on technology um, when you're talking about minimum viable size. But we've also come across one grower in a rural area in the Netherlands that's doing polyculture in like a beat up old greenhouse where there's, you know, some of the glass is broken and, you know, there's chickens wandering around and, um, and it's working really well because it's, it's based on proven fundamentals of permaculture. It's just scaled up to a commercial scale and then throwing in really fun greenhouse technology on top of it. But it's based on solid fundamentals that work in an open field also. Um, so it's, it's proven in that sense that it's not, it's not drawing on anything that hasn't worked in other, in other places so far. But in terms of yield, it's, it really depends on how, essentially, how much somebody wants to spend on the system. Um, and I can, I can give you specific numbers later if you're interested. <laughs> yeah? I was wondering, your, your pilot is going to be in Holland, right? Yes. Sorry, I couldn't hear the first part of that. How relevant, like, how yeah. that's going to, how do you perceive that's going to translate and depending on how it goes over there in the US? Yeah, so there's certain elements of it that translate and there are other ones that don't. The ones that do translate are how plants respond, or plants in polyculture respond within a controlled environment with this much diversity within a system. That should translate. Um, other things that don't translate are market prices. And for example, we have what are called farm gate prices, like the price that a farm gets going out the door as opposed to like market 
prices for what we actually pay in the supermarket. So we have farm gate prices and price lists for the US regionally, as opposed to prices for Europe is something that's enormously different. And then cost and availability of technology. And the Netherlands is what produces like most of the high-end greenhouse technology for the world, at least the intellectual property behind it, if not the manufacturing. So a lot of the costs and the feasibility behind using higher-end greenhouse technology sit in, you know, in individual technologies and asking how much of a price difference is there when we move from the, from the Netherlands to here, how much of a sort of technical capacity difference. If something breaks and you're in the Netherlands, you know, the Netherlands you can drive across it in an hour <laughs> and you can get your technical expert in the door. But if something goes wrong here and you have to start flying people in and, and things like that, there are very practical concerns along those lines. But in terms of the actual um, greenhouse environment, one of the things with a controlled environment is greenhouse technology is such now that you can make things pretty similar across scales um, and across different locations, for better or for worse. I think that there's the, one of the things with Polydome is we took some criticism when we first published some articles about it, because some people saw it as a technological fix to the food system. And so for us, we're not trying to provide a technological fix to the food system. We're trying to fit together all these different flows and components within a system and then sort of throw icing on the cake with the technological components. So it's something where in theory, somebody who just had a normal greenhouse in the Northeast can take these same ideas and we publish them under open source licensing. So like all this information is actually out on the web in a single report that explains how we did everything and what all the data is. Um, and so somebody should be able to take that and apply it to what they're doing here without too much difference. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about how this might change food distribution patterns? Yes, definitely. Um, and while I can't, um, I can't look into my crystal ball too far out with that without just getting into the realm of the purely hypothetical, the idea would be that it allows for, um, once you deal with the capital cost, and this is pretty capital intensive to build a high-tech greenhouse, especially in a city, um, once you get beyond the capital cost, you, you do run straight into real estate costs <laughs> and things like that, but there is the potential that one or one person or groups of people can develop locally appropriate greenhouse systems for wherever they are. That's not to say that all foods should ever be grown in a greenhouse. There are a lot of foods that should never be put in a greenhouse. It's just not worth it. You need it to be mechanized. You need it to be at scale. I don't think wheat should ever be grown in a greenhouse, for example. Um, but when it comes to vegetables, when it comes to higher value products, when it comes to essential components of a, of a secure and sovereign food system, um, I think while it's not a huge proportion or percentage of society yet, there are more and more people who are willing to, say, throw down a little bit of money on capital cost in order to secure some level of food security and food sovereignty down the line. Anything else before I move on? We can take more questions on this at the end. Okay. So I'm going to talk briefly about two other projects. Um, and this is a, these are at two other scales other than, than growing. Um, <clears throat> so the first one is a project that I did with a sustainable sushi restaurant in New Haven. And they're perhaps my most amusing client out of anybody I've ever worked with. Um, but what we're doing is going from this giant idea of an ecologically regenerative food system or economy or world down to a very practical question but still kind of highfalutin of what does a regenerative act of eating look like? Or like what could it look like? <laughs> because we don't really have that yet. I've yet to really find options where I'm like, this is great. What I just ate did something good for the world on all levels, not just, you know, well, I bought fair trade and there's like this cute picture of a person in a cooperative and that kind of thing. Um, or even, you know, I bought this from my local farmer, but once you start talking to your local farmers about what they have to go through in order to make that food for you, you're like, so you're doing something good for the environment and yeah, I'm supporting the local economy, but you work 18 hour days for nine months a year. Okay. Um, <laughs> so what we started to do was look specifically at fish from a perspective of regenerative eating. 
Um, the resolution on this isn't great. But to walk you guys through it, it's drawing on the idea of, you know, we have good information resources like Monterey Bay Aquarium, which can tell us, is this a green fish, is it a red fish, is it a yellow fish, you know, two fish, three fish, blue fish, et cetera. But there's a lot of complexity that is, A, masked within that information, if you ever want to go and read the technical sheets behind it. But it also misses out on all the other components of what it takes to get fish to you. Um, fortunately now there are a couple of community supported fisheries in the Northeast and it's a growing movement, but there's this whole question of what are the effects of eating fish? And then asking, we know we have issues with the oceans, we know we have issues with aquaculture, with farmed salmon, there's been a ton in the news about this over the last 10 years, but what would it mean to actually eat fish that was regenerative. And so we looked at every, at all the different types of fish that this restaurant was sourcing and started to break it down first by, you know, the two columns on the left are based on Monterey Bay Aquarium standards as well as Blue Ocean standards. But then taking it to who's the distributor we're getting this through, that, uh, which is a step that tends to be overlooked in the food system of how's this food actually getting to me? and asked some very functional questions, which may seem a little informal from a consultant's perspective of, would we want to have a beer with this person? You know, are, are they somebody where we actually feel like when we're giving our money to them and they're taking a pretty reasonable cut out of the money that's going into buying fish, are they somebody who we actually like want to sit down with? Are they nice? Do we like what they do with their money? Is this something that we support? Um, and so drawing out from there, what do we, like what you'll see in the right hand column, is what do we actually do with this fish and is it awesome? Was actually the question that we asked. We're like, what is the awesomeness factor? Does this inspire people? Is it, like when we take this fish and we turn it into a dish, do people love it? Is it something that's unique? Is it a unique experience that connects them back to that fish, that connects them to a sense of culture, that connects them potentially to each other? Um, and one of the components that goes into this is then the question of what's actually regenerative. And so not by no means are most of the offerings on the menu regenerative, but one of the things that's very different about the chef than most people is he promotes an invasive species menu. So in eating invasive species is one way to actually begin to be regenerative. Because then what we're doing is we're creating economic demand within the system to accomplish something that we have reason to value ecologically. And so the two, I, I took specifically this snapshot of what we're doing because it highlights the two species that are actually on the menu that are invasive and it's hand collected shore crabs, which are these tiny little crabs that like live under rocks in the Connecticut coastline. And if anybody's ever in Connecticut, you really can go and collect them and fry them and they're delicious, you just eat them whole. Um, but then we, they also serve hand speared lionfish from reefs off of Mexico. And so the idea with this is overall to go from just this fairly narrow ecological perspective of like, well, is this fish endangered? Okay, no, it's not endangered is usually, you know, the answer hopefully if we're eating it. And have we totally destroyed an ecosystem by catching it? Are like the two main questions that get asked. But that's not something that actually inspires me to want to eat. That's just the, is it, you know, is this terrible for the world for me to eat kind of question. And then the, the last thing we ask is, is it, it going to poison me? So essentially, is it endangered to destroy the planet and is it going to poison me? Isn't really a case for eating as far as I'm concerned. So um, yeah, again, this is about asking questions, not really about answers. But, um, but when it comes to framing what we're going to eat and what we're choosing to eat, it does come down to this. Like, what's actually going to make us happy? <laughs> like, what is delicious? What is awesome? What connects us to our food in a much more meaningful way and how can we start to take food and ask questions about it so that we can use food as a means to accomplish change within the system because food is what we all share for the most part if we're lucky um, and it, but it's one of the few things that all humans can share healthfully and pretty much all humans need everything else across cultures is different at some level you know like language values gender norms whatever it might be but food is something that we can agree to eat for the most part. So that's me as in a nutshell. Um, any questions before I move on? I don't want to take too much time with that one. So 
So the last one, and this is much more experimental, and this is a work in progress, is looking at the food system in Lowell, Massachusetts. And so this is a project that we started in January. And when I first signed up to do this presentation, we thought we were going to be doing an urban food production plan. And that is no longer the case. <laughs> we have pivoted, and what we're doing now is we are, instead of doing an urban food production plan, we are looking at actually mapping out the food system in the city for the Lowell, for the Lowell Food Security Coalition, and then developing resources for the coalition so that they can, one, establish shared objectives and goals, Two, understand what resources they already have that people are, may or may not be using yet. And then three, gain an understanding of how to draw on those resources to accomplish new goals. So I'm going to see if this works automatically from this link. And if it doesn't, I'm just going to go to it. OK. So if you guys will bear with me, I'm going to show you guys a website that has not gone live yet. So what this starts to look like, this is, like I said, bear with me, this is a draft website. Um, we're actually doing our first review call with people from this project tomorrow to get feedback on this. Um, but what this looks like is we first took essentially a poll of everybody who was actually participating in the, in the Lowell Food Security Coalition and divided them up by category. So what you can see then is actually who's participating within the Lowell food system, broken down by organizations dedicated to food distribution and access, um, food production in local markets, and then sustainability and planning resources. And so we took that and combined it with their community food assessment, which they'd already created, and broke down their community food assessment into 12 shared objectives that everybody within the coalition agreed to. And so for each of these now, and this is not the most sophisticated website on the planet, because like I said, this is a first go at looking at this. So objective one is partnerships with wholesale organizations. So what it does is it lets people within the coalition who may or may not like literally be aware of all the other organizations that are within the coalition, or actually even their mission, let alone what they bring to the table. So, or particularly what they're trying to accomplish going into the future. So what this does is it actually brings together the, the objective and then the organizations that are linked to that objective and working on it. So in this instance, we've got the Lowell Farmers Market, the United Teen Equality Center, and the Merrimack Valley Food Bank. And so if we click on any of their postings, this will take a second, you get the Merrimack Valley Food Bank, what it does, who's in charge of it, and then where it is located. As well as, if you keep going down, this is where it's in draft format still, so you guys got to bear with me. Um, understanding of what the organization's doing, which objectives they are working towards, the resources and expertise that they can offer to other organizations within the network, um, and then the projects and initiatives that they're working on right now, as well as what the actual partnerships and networks that they're using right now are. So what this all comes together into is a mapping tool. If I can scroll just a little bit, <laughs> you guys will be able to see it. Maybe this isn't going to work. Oh, that would be too bad. There's supposed to be a drop-down mem menu that pops out from this that I'm not able to see right now. OK. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, if this was working, <laughs> so I apologize for the draft, what you'd see is, is curated maps. And so there's this, I was saying to some of people who I was having dinner with here, we're not lacking data and information availability in the world. We're lacking abil uh, the ability to sort through it in meaningful ways. So the last section of this, which is not popping up right now, is curated maps that show which organizations are involved in urban food production, which was sort of our original mission was to look at that, and where they're located and what they're working on right now. 
and then showing where there is food retail for people that are interested in food access. Um, and so the idea with the different curated maps is then to be able to take those and use the resources that are displayed on these maps and the information so in a way that allows the organizations within the coalition to come together and say, how can we accomplish new goals? And so one instance of that um, is we've been speaking with the food bank that runs a lot of the emergency food providers in the area. And one of their concerns is that they want to do gleaning from local farms, which is sort of you know, taking excess um, or unused produce that is no longer marketable and bringing it into food banks and emergency food providers. But that's a pretty distributed and diffuse process as of right now because there's no distribution system for picking this up. And they're already under-resourced. They're not going to send around their employees like with a sedan picking up a box of lettuce here and like a pumpkin here and some apples in another spot. And so what they're going to be doing is piloting using this system for understanding which farms are they going to draw on? And then what are the other resources that they can bring together to get together volunteers and transportation and distribution all into one team so that they can actually accomplish this goal of using extra produce within the system and bringing that into emergency food providers to give people better food access. So um, I apologize again for the lack of, of maps, um, but that is the way things go sometimes. <laughs> so. In closing, do you guys have any questions about that? It'll be live at the end of this month in a much more beautiful format than it is now. <laughs> yeah. What are you using for your mapping? Using the Google Maps API? Ah, good question. Um, specifically for this, we, one of our trade-offs within the project is that we don't want to hand an, uh, or under-resourced organizations like a Porsche when they really like wanted a Ford. And so there are a lot of different mapping platforms that are out there now that require varying levels of technological capabilities. And so what we did was settle on something that was, it was actually possible for sort of a lay person to learn to edit in the back end, but that still had a reasonable amount of functionality. So what we are using is a WordPress site with um, a plugin called Leaflet Maps Maker, or Maps Marker. Um, I'm not the one who's actually the technical person doing the, the back end of it. But there are a lot of other options out there. The one that um, a lot of people like to use is Carto DB, is the one that produces like a lot of the cooler looking maps that you see online, but requires actual like technical programming expertise to really use effectively. Um, and one of the things that is coming online, how many people here have heard of Google Engine? Google so, Engine? No, Google Engine. It's, it's, it'll be launched fully. It's like in pilot mode, and they're, they're trying it with a number of different organizations at the moment. But Google Engine is a resource going forward that combines everything that you have with Google Earth and Google Maps with a heck of a lot more computing capabilities um, and a lot more analytical capabilities going forward. So, so wrapping this up though, especially because we're going to lose audio, um, is this idea of trust and collaboration infrastructure. And this is like a really new idea for me. <laughs> and I googled it and it isn't really even out there as a concept, but it's sort of my, it's my new working thing as of like a couple of weeks ago, is the idea of what is it actually mean to look at trust and collaboration from an infrastructure and scalability perspective. So instead of just saying like, we want people to work together, and yeah, we know if we get people in a room, we facilitate a conversation, they're going to be friends. Like, that's cool, but how do we do this on a much larger scale? How do we start to look at all these questions that I've been raising tonight? Like I said, I wasn't going to give a lot of answers, but all these questions from a scalable and structural perspective. And I have no idea of what that looks like yet. I know that mapping is part of it, and I know that technology is part of it, and I know that face-to-face -face interaction is another huge part of it, because we're never going to get, the, my goal is not ever to get away from face-to-face -face interaction, but also to say, we need face-to-face -face interaction, but we also need a whole lot of digital tools to help us, because we're going to have a 9 or 10 billion person planet at some point. And we need to also address things at some level of scale, if not necessarily always thinking on the, you know, the billions level. So 
on that note, one of my other favorite quotes, which is, hunger has always been an invitation to make a better world and remains so. Um, that's what I will say in closing. Um, but I'd love to take any questions that you guys have on any broader issues or ideas um, or you know, poking at any of the ideas that I've said that don't make sense or anything along those lines. Great. <laughs> so yeah, yes. 